So I, I want to make a really sort of graceful segue from Lori talking about her very impressive catalog at the Media Archaeology Lab and talk about um, a different sort of catalog and a catalog in a book. So um, first of all, I want to say that I'm following on um, Trevor's mention of the importance of teams to DH. Here I am today presenting on behalf of Team Stainforth. If there are Team Stainforth members in the audience, could you please raise your hand? Holly. <laughs> um, so this team includes Deborah Hollis and Special Collections, Holly Long, CU Libraries, um, myself, I'm in the English department, I'm a romanticist, um, Elizabeth Newsom in CU Libraries, and the support and enthusiasm of Special Collections colleagues, Amanda Brown, Susan Gwynchipman, Chris Levine, Greg Robel, and multiple students. Um, we are really an excited team. Specifically, we're passionate about a mid-19th century manuscript in our rare books collection here in Norland Library entitled Catalog of the Library of Female Authors of the Reverend J. Uh, Francis Stainforth. To understand the manuscript, it helps to know a little bit about the author, though there, admittedly there's not that much published about him. Like many people with money to spend in 19th century Britain, the Reverend Francis John Stanforth devoted his surplus funds to collecting things and his surplus time to curating and documenting his archives. He is most famous as a stamp collector. He provided the basis for the first stamp catalog published in English and for having inspired the formation of the Royal Philatelic Society in 1869. Stanforth also possessed an important collection of seashells, I've learned. However, what is most fascinating to me as a scholar of 18th and 19th century literature is that during his lifetime, Stainforth collected over 6,000 books in his private library. This library is not only important for its considerable size, but also for its particular contents. His 6,000 volume library contained only works written by American and British women poets and playwrights. The range of authors, uh, authors whose works he collected date from 15th century author Juliana Burns, 18th century African-American author Phyllis Wheatley, and Victorian era author Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Genres represented in the collection include poetry, plays, novels, essays, letters, and manuscripts, but only those written by female poets or playwrights. This voluminous collection enables us to ask and, with the help of computer analysis, to answer questions about how women's writing was circulated, valued, collected, organized, and displayed in the 19th century. The knowledge of this important historical library of women's writing exists today thanks to Stainforth's foresight and assiduous dedication to recording his entire bibliographical project in this 600-page manuscript that we are so fortunate to own here at CU. Before his death in 1866, Stainforth painstakingly logged the author, title, publication information, and shelf location of each and every book in this vast library. So here you can see this is a typical page spread. Oops. He also tracked his wish list of books to acquire in the same catalog manuscript and crossed off each book as he added it to his library and to his catalog list of holdings. Um, and I have to say, finding the wish list was a true Indiana Jones moment. Um, my colleague Greg Robel and I were looking at the book and we, on a whim, flipped it over. And in the back, upside down, is, is where the wish list starts. So that was a really fun moment of discovery for us. Um, this catalog of his 6,000 books and his ambitious wish list has been scanned for public access to page images that can be found in our um, digital library in Luna. So you're thinking, why didn't we stop after scanning the page images of the Stainforth and publishing them in our digital library? Why take the very long road and turn this manuscript into a searchable database? There are four important answers to this question. First, the exceptional size and scope of Stainforth's collection. It adds a new kind of historical collection of women's writing to those available online at present. It offers a counter view to the auctioneer's published catalog. And lastly, 
we want to use the database to learn more about the circulation, collection, and value of women's writing in the 19th century as encountered by an actual buyer of these books. St uh, my first point is that Steenforth's collection was the size and scope of a world-class spectacle. His 6,000 books by American and British women poets and playwrights would have been considered an enormous collection in the mid-19th century. In fact, for the time, this collection would have been considered nearly large enough to be a spectacle at the World's Fair with an audience of millions. In 1893, about 25 years after Stanford's death, the World's Columbian Exhibition, uh, Exposition in Chicago featured an attraction called the Women's Building. In addition to being a hub for women's activities, exhibits, and organizations, the Women's Building contained a bibliographic spectacle, a collection of 7,000 books, quote, authored, illustrated, edited, or translated by women. According to book history scholar Sarah Wadsworth, this collection was, quote, the first attempt in history to represent a single collection, uh, to represent in a single collection the global contribution of women to the world of letters, end quote. More than 27 million people came to the World's Columbian Exposition where the Women's Building Book exhibit showed for seven consecutive months. Wadsworth described the collection and its spectacle as follows. Quote, truly more of a museum of books than a fully operational library. The Women's Building uh, Library was experienced chiefly as spectacle and display of the countless visitors of 1893 who gazed at the walls and walls of gleaming oak bookcases, peered into the display cases of autograph manuscripts and other literary artifacts, or simply admired the portraits and busts of famous women writers. With this emphasis on materiality and material culture of texts, the WBL made physically evident to fairgoers what could formally only be imagined, the substantial literary and intellectual achievement of women." End quote. Wadsworth's description of the 1893 World Exposition book exhibit sounds an awful lot like Stainforth's own collection, despite the 1,000 book difference, and, of course, without paying viewers. If the WBL's 7,000 book exhibit compiled by a brigade of collectors, was large enough to be a spectacle in 1893 for an audience of 27 million people, then Stainforth's collection of 6,000 books by women authors, compiled by just one person, was certainly big enough to be the size and scope of a world-class spectacle in the 1860s. Though it was not set on as grand, as, uh, on as grand or as public a stage as the Women's Building Collection, Stainforth's collection was the true first library to show the global contributions of women writers through the medium of the library, 30 years before the World's Fair exhibit. A second reason to make a database project from the Stainforth manuscript is that it will offer a new kind of historical collection of women's writing to those that are already on the web. In her essay, Can Information Be Unfettered?, Amy Earhart calls for digital humanists to examine the canon that we are constructing and further encourages us to reinvigorate the spirit of previous scholars who believed that textual recovery was crucial to their work. The Stainforth database editors answer Earhart's call by recovering women's writing in a collection that reflects how it was obtained and valued by those in the mid 19th century book market. In contrast, most digital projects that recover women's writing include texts selected by contemporary scholars' research agendas. Third, creating the creation of the Stanforth Catalog database is an important act of scholarship because it offers a counter view to the only other published record of Stanforth's library, the auctioneer's list. After Stanforth's death in 1866, the auction house Sotheby, Wilkinson, and Hodge published the list of his books to be sold off during a six-day-long auction in 1867. Sotheby's auction list contained 3,076 separate lots, including all of Stainforth's books, as well as some manuscripts and engravings. 
The auction list even contains an entry for Stainforth's own catalog manuscript, the one that the auctioneers probably use to make their own list, and the book we have down, um, and it's also the book that we have downstairs in special collections. It follows that Sotheby's version of the catalog is not built to promote the publications of women poets and playwrights. Rather, it's been edited purely for profit. The auction catalog even sports a new title, which doubles as a sales pitch for the auction lots. It's long. It reads, Catalog of the Extraordinary Library, unique of its kind, formed by the late Reverend F.J. Steenforth, consisting entirely of works of British and American poetesses, and female dramatic writers, together with some interesting unpublished manuscripts and autograph letters, also a few engravings, framed and glazed. That's the end of the title. <laughs> the title as advertisement is a good indication of what the auction house did with Stainforth's manuscript. They used it to make a comprehensive list that was tempting to buyers, who would show no remorse about plucking apart this important monument to women's authorship in the process of building up their own book collections. At present, Gale publishes two versions of Sotheby's Stainforth auction catalog in its Sabin Americana series. There is also a uh, No Frills print on demand edition, and I have it here with me on the table to show afterward. Um, uh, it, and it also, Gail also offers an electronic edition of the same auction catalog that CU Libraries subscribes to, and that's been really useful for this project for me. While Gail's electronic auction list is somewhat searchable, it does suffer from some dirty OCR, it also lacks valuable information that is in the actual manuscript catalog that drastically col colors the way um, Stainforth's collection is received today by scholars. First, it does not have Stainforth's shelf marks for each work that tell us how he organized his collection in his library. The auctioneers replaced the shelf marks with lot numbers, signifiers of the library's dissolution. The auction list lacks Stainforth's equal valuation of each work in his catalog. Unsurprisingly, the auction house catalog annotates the list of items in Stainforth's collection to emphasize the value and rarity of certain items. Those items are, that are not especially notable or valuable receive no special annotation. For example, and you can look at the current, um, the current slide, you can see that the auctioneers annotate auction item 283, Juliana Berner's 16th century edition of the book of hawking, hunting, and fishing, with a long note that describes it as black letter with woodcuts, the first title page, A4, a small co corner of the last leaf supplied in facsim facsimile, Morocco, of extensive rarity, the only copy noticed in Loundon's manual, is that priced in the Bibliotheca Anglo-Poetica at 35 pounds. <laughs> Most items in the auction list have no annotation of their particular value. On the left here, you have Stainforth's entry for this work in his manuscript. That's it. That's all you get. <laughs> Just that small blue rectangle. And it, uh, additionally, the Sotheby's version has a preface, and in the preface it mentions this book as well. So it's getting a lot of attention um, from the auctioneers, and Stainforth really just counted it as one among a number of books in his collection. Um, so in the manuscript, you know, this important book has the same value as the entries above and below it. The auction list also lacks Stainforth's manuscript organization. Works in the auction catalog are sometimes grouped by author and sometimes sold separately, depending on what will make the most profit for the auction house. And finally, Sotheby's auction catalog entirely omits Stainforth's wish list. There's no sign in the Sotheby's list of Stainforth's desired acquisitions or that at one time he wanted a book and then could happily add it to the, cor to the correct main catalog page. On the verso side, left blank for new acquisitions. For the auctioneers, the wish list had no value. If a book wasn't present in the library to sell, why bother listing it? CU Library's Stainforth database project will enable searchable digital access to Stainforth's landmark library and catalog not as it was valued and sold off by auctioneers for profit, but instead, our database will recollect and display Stainforth's books as the collector organized and valued each work listed in his catalog manuscript. Again, this includes all of the 6,000 works he could acquire in London that were published by women poets and dramatists between the 16th 
and the mid-19th centuries, as well as the valuable wish list in the back of his catalog that helps us track the acquisition process. The Stainforth database project needs to exist in order to balance out the auction house view that has been the only accessible version of Stainforth's collection to date. So, what are we building? We want to use the searchable catalog database we're creating to generate visualizations and tools that scholars can use for further work. The visualizations we want to create include a virtual representation of Stainforth's library, as well as mapped, network, uh, mapped networks of the book's publishers, printers, and subscribers. I argue that Stainforth's manuscript catalog is designed to function as a finding aid for locating certain books in his collection, but also as a blueprint for rebuilding his library. In other words, Stanforth wanted his catalog to be used to find items within his collection and to reassemble the collection. In other words, his shelf marks are a sign of his ownership and curation of these books. His manuscript catalog lists his holdings in alphabetical order by author last name. Under each author's name, editions are listed chronologically from earliest to latest. Thus, a researcher curious to see if he has any books by Anne Radcliffe in his collection can find the place where the R's start in the manuscript and work forward from there. And to see how the books were organized on his shelves, on the other hand, one must match up the shelf marks and find out which books were neighbors. To save loads of time, we will use computing to organize the volumes uh, by shelf marks and can then analyze Stainforth's bibliographical schema. Rebuilding the collection using Stainforth's shelf marks can help us answer a long list of questions, and I have my own personal long list that has to do with my dissertation, but here are some more general ones. How women's authorship may have been categorized, um, identified, and stored in the mid-19th century by genre, by author, by size of book, by pub date, or by edition, for example. His shelf marks include or indicate that books were not stored in alphabetical order by author, Thus, the organizing principle will be deciphered after we enter and sort the shelf marks. Knowing how his books were organized provides a clue about how published books by women were valued and experienced in a library during the mid-19th century. Again, not by contemporary scholars. Finally, rebuilding Stainforth's library recreates the spectacle that his library once was, a world-class collection of American and British women's writing that had it been shown 30 years later, would have drawn a crowd at the World's Fair. We would, like to do a so we would also like to do social network mapping in order to learn more about the professional networks surrounding women poets and playwrights in the 19th century. And in particular, we will map publishers, printers, and subscribers that help fund, produce, and distribute books authored by women and that all have this one um, node of, of a buyer in common, Stainforth himself. So where are we now? Deep into transcription. While we have long-term goals for producing visualizations with our data, we also have to pay strict attention to our current task, which is transcription. We have about 500 more pages to transcribe. Um, and we hope to acquire funding so that students can be paid to help us with this transcription effort. In the process, students would learn a lot about book history, working with manuscripts, and even a little computer science. Holly Long created a system whereby we can access PDFs of the manuscript pages and transcribe one line at a time into a Google form. The Google form feeds data into our database, linked by page and line number, and also by cross-references between entries when Stainforth indicates this, and he does often, which is totally fascinating. So what's next for Team Stainforth? Our first priority is to finish transcribing the catalog so that we can move on with our lives. No, um, so that we so that we can so that we can have the text of each entry in the database to search on, right? Um, as well as all of the shelf marks for each item and the wish list. This offers researchers their first opportunity to not just read the entries in the Stainforth or to use the um, the auctioneer's catalog but to use the search field to find specific authors, titles, or dates as Stainforth's original manuscript um, valued them. Uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to have students help us with this process so that we can simultaneously start our TEI encoding part of the project to provide encoded linked text for each entry in the catalog, which essentially rebuilds a virtual edition of this library. 
We plan to use open source pre-encoded texts where we can find them, uh, since all of these works are in the public domain and many have been digitized and encoded already. We're already looking forward to taking the Stainfoth on the road to this year's MLA in Chicago to participate in the DH from the ground up session. And we look forward to drafting grant proposals for additional funding for our project. So we, we have our own wish list also, in addition to Stainforth's wish list. Um, so I want, and I want to include with, uh, conclude with this topic because um, we were prompted to address it. So this isn't just a, a, a pitch from out of nowhere. Um, so while we are really charmed to have this incredible manuscript to turn into a machine readable and processable data, and we are equally ecstatic about our interdisciplinary team, we do have a few needs regarding skills and funding. We need training as a team since only one of us, that's me, uh, has had training and experience with TEI encoding. We will also be creating and processing a large data set, so re we remain ever hopeful that our application to the MYTH data curation workshop <laughs> <laughs> um, will be accepted, though I'm sure we have, ex <laughs> I'm sure we have extremely stiff competition. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh, right. Um, we don't require any additional technology for this project yet, but we do very much need funding to help pay uh, to help with the transcription process and with pro and with the process of finding and encoding electronic texts that will be in Stainforth's virtual library. The final two items on my wish list would provide more general support for DH scholars at CU Boulder. I've been working in DH, uh, on DH projects since about 2008, and the majority of the time that my DH network, and for the majority of that time, my DH network has been located um, outside of my home institution. I ask questions and participate in dialogue with DH colleagues from all over the country, in Canada, and in England, with the help of social networks like Twitter. And I try to attend one DH event per year so that I can learn from my colleagues face to face. I'm so delighted that this symposium is set up and is a step toward bringing together digital humanists on this campus in a shared workspace, a room on campus where we can find other DHers working and see what it looks like <laughs> to see other DHers working at the same time as you are. I've, I've, you, know, you rarely get to do that. Um, much like book projects, DH projects require a great deal of labor, troubleshooting, celebration of tiny successes, funding, and long-term project planning. Senior DH colleagues have made great strides toward DH work counting for tenure and promotion, um, as we heard earlier with our expert speakers. And I hope that in the near future, graduate student DH work will also count toward our degree re requirements here at CU. However, unlike most book projects, DH work often requires a team of collaborators from various disciplines. And Team Stainforth looks, looks forward to sharing knowledge with and learning from other project teams here at CU. So thank you. I have, I have one quick announcement. So I have put the, or I've requested that Special Collections puts the um, Stainforth manuscript out on display. So you'll be able to go check it out. It's actually in this building. Um, it's uh, room N345, so it's just downstairs from where we are, and I'd be happy to, to take you down there if you'd like to go look at it with me.